Okay. So here is the question. The question is saying that the figure shows the results from an, from an experiment in which the effect of different concentrations of substrate on the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction was investigated. Now, the moment you read that statement, first internalize that statement. What are they meaning in this context here? Then from there, after interpreting and internalizing that statement, then you now go to the next statement. Never proceed to a next statement without first internalizing, without first internalizing the first statement that you have read. And we shall go through that uh, slowly. So they're saying that it is an experiment. And in this experiment, they were investigating the effect of different concentrations of substrate. So they have different concentrations of the substrate. And then they now want to see the effect of these different concentrations on the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. So th that, that is the interpretation. You read the question, you interpret. If you say it is hard to interpret, then you first break it down into components. Then after breaking it down into different components, then now you see if it is again making sense. The idea of you going through the interpretation of these questions is such that you break them up into in, in two sections that you can easily understand and answer. In other words, you read the question to simplify it for your own self, in your own way. How do you understand it in your own way? So I hope now we are all on the same page, that we have different concentrations, and they want now to see the effect of these concentrations on the rate of enzyme activity. Then the second statement is saying the experiment was then repeated using the same experimental conditions and substrate concentrations, but in the presence of fixed amounts of compounds A and B in the concentration of 0 0.2 molars, uh, millimolars. Now, still, without now going to the graph, have you understood the meaning of that statement? If you've not yet understood it, don't rush to the next step. So here they are saying the experiment, now the experiment of looking at the effect of different concentrations on the rate of enzyme activity, they are saying they repeated that experiment and they used the same conditions. The only difference was that now on top of these sub different concentrations of the sub on this substrate in different concentrations, they now, added amounts of A, of compound A, and amounts of compound B. So what does it mean? And now they get the substrates. After getting the substrates, then the rate concentration that they want to use. Now in this substrate, they now add there a fixed amount of compound A. Then they get another one, they add there a fixed amount of compound B. So it means that now the whole of this experiment was done three times, three times for each concentration. The first time, it just used the substrate only. Then the second time, substrate plus compound A. Then the third time, substrate plus compound B. So it means that that is what they did. Then after going through that interpretation, now, of course, you're now trying to even, for now, you must have even have gotten the idea of what actually they were doing. And you have even thought of the possible responses or the possible observations. What do you expect in this case? So, now let us look at now our data. 
Now, when you look at our data, so here we have rate of reaction. Then here we have the substrate concentration. We have three graphs because remember we said from what we have read now so far, we know that this experiment was done three times. The experiment was done three times. So here, the first graph, they got these results when they used only the substrate without compounds A and B. So this is compounds A and B absent. Then you look at this one here. This one, when they added compound A, then this one, when they added the compound B. So what do you see here? You can see that um, when they added compound A, you can see how the rate of reaction was. And when they added compound B, you can also notice how the rate of reaction behaved. And when none of these was present, you can also notice what actually happened. Now, before now still going to rush to see which question are you going to answer? You should now, first of all, find out what is happening in these graphs or what was happening in this experiment. Why are they getting these results? You start asking yourself those questions. And when you ask those, yourself those questions, you must answer them. Now, all that time that you take, you are trying to internalize, you're trying to understand the whole experiment. In that, by the time you now start answering the real questions that, that, that they're going to ask you, you actually, you're well conversant with the whole question, with the graphs, with the whole setup. Then they will find it very easy to answer the question. Uh -huh. So now here, for instance, what do I see? I'm seeing here a broken line having maximum rate of reaction is also maximum reaction rate with the B. So it means that now here, this rate here, I don't, this figure must be around 100, maybe 108 something, this one here. So now 108 is actually the maximum rate of reaction. Then this one had around maybe, um, around maybe 65 could be is, is the maximum rate of reaction when they add substance B into the reaction. Then still, you, then you start just asking yourself things. Now, why would they put rate of reaction? It means now here, none of these two reach the maximum rate of reaction. So it means that now in our experiments, none of the treatments the maximum rate of reaction. Then also B did not reach its maximum rate of reaction. It didn't reach. Then you start now asking yourself, because for now you should now be, you should now be knowing that they are likely to ask you something like that. Why is it that they don't reach maximum rate of reaction? All those questions you ask yourself and you try to develop reason why. Hmm? And even you get maybe a pen or a pencil, you summarize all of your ideas. You summarize all of your ideas still on that question paper. In that, when it is time for now answering, if they ask you, you had already brainstormed a question like that one. So here, of course now, I will, I will, uh, later I will pose to you the question, why you think the maximum rate of reaction was, was not reached. Then, um, when you look at now this one here, then you look at compound A. When you look at compound A, so that when compound A and B were absent, you notice that the rate of reaction was so rapid. If you compare this to this and this, these are three lines. You compare that now this one, the rate of reaction was very rapid compared to these others. But of course, you should now start asking yourself questions. Why was that the case? Because be sure that they're likely to ask you something like that. Then when you look at now, when compound A and B were present, what happened to the overall rate of reaction? You notice that, for instance, 
in absence of compound A and B, the rate of reaction increased rapidly with the increase in substrate concentration and attained the maximum within, short, within very small concentrations of the substrate. But when, you, when they added substance B, the rate of reaction, yes, it increased rapidly, but not more than when compounds A and B were absent. Then you now start asking yourself now, what, what is the effect of, the, of adding this substance B to our rate of reaction? Obviously, the effect is clear. Here, from here, the effect of adding it is it may be you've seen that from here what do we see we see that actually the thing has lowered the thing has decreased the thing has decreased so at first it was rapid now it is decreasing so it means substance a and substance b actually have an overall effect of decreasing the rate of reaction now, why are you saying that they have an overall effect of decreasing the rate of reaction? Because that reaction can proceed without these substances here. So without these substances, we witnessed that the rate of reaction was very high. Then when substances were added, you realize that now we no longer have a higher rate of, meaning that now they decrease. So it means that now substances A and B have an effect of decreasing the rate of reaction from here. Then now you ask yourself, what are these substances A and B? What are those things that reduce the rate of reaction? You get the answer. Then after asking yourself all those questions, then you now proceed now to the questions that you're going to answer specifically. Now, I'm going to open the discussion for all of you. Um, someone is interested in sharing this document. Uh, let, me, let me share this document in a box in that you can be able to download it. But meanwhile, um, these are the questions that we have to, we're going to brainstorm. I want you to tell me, what are these substances A and B? And what is the effect of these substances on the rate of reaction? That is question. The question, the first question I'm, I'm asking is, what are substances A and B? Then the second question is, what is the effect of these substances A and B on the rate of reaction? Then the third question is, why is it hard to for these reactions? to attain their maximum rate. The third question is, why is it hard for these reactions to attain their maximum rate? That is the third question. Then, okay, let us first look at those ones now. Um, so let me share the document, maybe as I'm sharing the document, be reflecting on those, um, questions that I have asked you, then we start. Meanwhile, you can also be sending your responses in the box, those ones who can. Please let me repeat it. Those ones enabling their videos, we are not interested in the videos.
So I have shared the document uh, inbox. You should be able to access it and download it. Okay, uh -huh. the responses. Inbox, people are saying that uh, um, Edry Adams is saying the effect is that they lower the rate of reaction. That is good. Um, then the hope is saying, I think substance A is a competitive inhibitor. Well, substance B is a non-competitive inhibitor. Uh -huh. Yes, hope, thank you. Mary is saying, so do these meetings usually happen, A? <laughs> hope, what do you think? Well, they always happen. Uh, then Dr. Lodio says A and B are inhibitors. Uh, we already have doctors already. So we have doctors now studying biology or future aspects. So maybe we'll have a doctor in the making. Okay. So bias saying A and B are enzyme inhibitors. Uh, um, I'm reading the responses. Um, people are saying, can I have, I have shared the document inbox. Go to inbox and download that document. It is there. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. So far inbox. So without repeating ourselves. So yes, substances A and B are inhibitors. And the, someone was tell us that A is a competitive inhibitor and B is a non-competitive inhibitor. Though we shall eventually later find out why are you saying that A is the competitive and B is a non-competitive inhibitor. Uh -huh. So then the third question was, so we are all responding to the third question. Why is it that these substances, so these rates of reactions do not reach their maximum? The question that now we are answering is, why do you think that these rates of reactions do not reach their maximum rate of reaction? As we can see from this graph here. Uh huh. We responded to that question. Why do we think that all these reactions do not reach their maximum rate of reaction? Nakaziba is saying they are inhibited. Nakaziba, no. That is wrong. Why? Because look at the first graph. This graph where compounds A and B are absent. The inhibitors are not there, but you can see still it is not able to reach its maximum reaction rate. Um, yes, Queen Patricia. Okay, I think because of limited concentration of the enzymes, even if we're increasing the substrate concentration by the Concentration of the enzymes is constant, so that makes the rate of reaction not to reach maximum. Uh huh. So, Queen Patricia is saying because of the limitations imposed by the rate, the concentration of the enzymes. Uh huh. Then another another one. What are others saying? Uh huh. That someone is saying other factors becoming limiting factors. Uh huh. Other factors become limiting factors, okay. Then Michelle is saying, rates of reaction don't reach their maximum because inhibitors reduce enzyme binding sites. Uh, Michelle, that is not correct. We have discussed why it is not about the inhibitors because in the first graph, inhibitors are not, are not there. Um, Olodio is saying, air binds are the active site of the enzyme compete with the active site. I don't know which question you're answering. Um, uh, then he, someone is saying they think because time comes when the active sites are all expired. Mm, okay, we shall see. And the situation of binding sites and enzymes, okay. Um, okay. 
Okay, now some of you actually practice and some of you have it. The thing is simple. What are we looking at here? We notice that when we increase the substrate concentration, our rate of reaction also increases. Look at a point like here at five concentrations. At five, the rate of reaction, yes, is increasing, but this rate of reaction is still low. So why is the rate of reaction still low at five molars? It is because the reaction is being limited by the substrate concentration. We are now at this point when the rate is low, it is now that it is the substrate concentration that is limiting our reaction. Then if we now keep on increasing, we shall increase the substrate and reach a time when now our reaction reaches the highest maximum point. Now at that highest maximum point, it means that now the substrate concentration is no longer a limiting factor. No, it is no longer a limiting factor. Now, there must be other factors that you have not thought of that are now failing, that are now, um, um, are now making sure that this rate of reaction is not able to reach the maximum rate. So that is the answer, that the, these reactions will not reach their maximum rate because other factors other than the substrate concentration are now limiting this process. Should you also cater for those other factors? Actually, our rate can increase and eventually reach its fullest reaction capacity. Then someone gave us now the one of the enzyme because it's being limited by enzyme concentration. Yes, now enzyme concentration is one of the factors that we are talking about here. But now we are not so sure that it is actually the, the enzyme that is limiting it. That's why we, instead of saying that the enzyme concentration is limiting now the reaction or is preventing the reaction from reaching its maximum rate, rather say that other factors, then you can maybe you can mention those factors that you think. Other factors like temperature, like substrate concentration, maybe like the pH are the ones that are now limiting the process or the reaction, denying it or preventing it from reaching its maximum reaction rate. So that is what it means. Aha. Uh -huh. Then another question. Aha, uh -huh, Leticia is saying, explain what it means by limiting factor. Uh, Leticia, I know she might be in the senior five. Now, a limiting factor, like the word limiting is, for all reactions that are affected by very many factors, that the rate at which that reaction is taking place will always be limited by that factor present in its lowest concentration. I'll give you an example. Factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. For those factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis, we have temperature, we have light, we have carbon dioxide concentration, ETC. Meaning that now, if you want your leaf to increase the rate at which it's carried out photosynthesis, you increase the light intensity. So when you increase the light intensity, then what happens? The rate of photosynthesis is going to increase. But however, you are only increasing light intensity. What about other factors? Should we say that you forget about temperature? If you, if you forget about temperature, yes, you have increased the light. Then the process will now be wanting temperature now that you should also raise the temperature. Then you raise the temperature. Then it again now demands you to raise some other factor. So raise that now for you to have maximum reaction. You have to make sure that all of the factors that affect 
are available in their maximum concentrations or their maximum amounts or intensities. So should one of those be lower, then that one which is lower is what we describe as a limiting factor. Yeah, like when you escape from schools, you know, some of you have a tendency of escaping from school. If you escape from school as a group, maybe say you're a group of 10 and you're very tight buddies, the moment you jump the fence, then you start running. I'm sure in your group, you'll have that person who is going to run the slowest. All of, all of you may not be running at the same pace. You may have the, fast run, the fastest runner amongst you and the slowest runner. Now, who is going to limit your running away? Or who is going to determine the speed at which you run? The, your slowest runner is going to determine your speed because you cannot leave this person behind. So it means that now the slowest runner in your group is the one that is actually limiting you. He's the one limiting you from achieving your maximum speed that you can run after escaping from school. You want to run so fast that they don't catch you in case maybe they, they, there is an, as, as, an Ascari running after you. You want to run very fast, but however, your speed is going to be limited by that person in your group who is running slowest. So it means now the slowest is always the one who determines the speed. Likewise here, if a process is affected by very many factors, the rate at which that process is taking place will always be limited by that factor that is present in small concentrations or in small amounts. That is a limiting factor. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Then he, Jonathan is asking, what is an enzyme inhibitor? Uh -huh. Now, this one must be senior five. Now, those ones in senior fives, we don't know what enzyme inhibitors are. Just kindly for now, just follow through the discussion. Um, we're just going to see how uh, this graph can be answered. Later, you'll even learn what inhibitors are. But however, these are things you learn in school under the topic of enzymes. Like the word to inhibit. Inhibit something, do something from that. Okay, so now someone said that compound A is a, com a, a, com a competitive inhibitor and compound B is a non competitive inhibitor. And I agree. The question from me to you is what is why do you think that compound A is a competitive inhibitor? And compound B is a non competitive inhibitor. Who can tell us? Who can give us now the explanation? Hey, who was that person? Was it? Was it Hope or it was another person? Yes. Um, yes, Hope. Okay, sir. I say that compound A. Was a competitive inhibitor, then compound B was a non competitive inhibitor. So, the reason why I said that compound A is a competitive inhibitor because uh, the rate of reaction reduced because eh? it was increasing gradually. Eh? But further increase in substrate concentration, eh? It made it to increase. Okay, like I can say that remember, competitive inhibitor eh? is the one that attaches itself or that combines, it has a complementary shape or the same shape as the, the what? The substrate. So it combines the, at the active site of the what? Of the enzyme. But increase in substrate concentration eh? also now increases the what? The rate of reaction. Since now this, the substrate out competes for the active what? Out, out competes the, the inhibitor. Hmm? He's increasing the rate of reaction. That's why I say that compound A is a competitive inhibitor. Since now, further increase in substrate concentration increase its what? It's rate of reaction. Whereas mm. 
compound B, it's a, a what? A non competitive inhibitor. In a way that non competitive inhibitors, they combine with the enzyme at any other part other than the what? The active site, altering mm -hmm. the shape of the active site. There are four. The what? The rate of reaction no longer can no longer like uh, go forward. So it doesn't, for it, it, it stops. Because now it, when it combines with the, with the what? With the, with the enzyme at any other part other than the active site, altering the active, active site, therefore the substrate can no longer fit with the active site. Therefore, the, the, what, the rate of reaction just stops. And for non-competitive inhibitor, inhibition, increase in substrate concentration, has no effect on the rate of reaction. That's why for it, it when it increased and then the compound A was there, it just stopped. But for this one of, for compound A, it increased beyond that one of com compound B. Now, concentration would increase the what? The rate of reaction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Now, those ones, if you've been following uh, what Hope was telling us, Hope has actually explained to us what a, co a competitive inhibitor is and how it works. And she has also explained to us what a non-competitive inhibitor is and how it works. Then after that, she now gives us reasons Based on the evidence that we have on the graph here, why she thinks compound A is competitive and compound B is non-competitive. Uh -huh. I want another person also now to give us another alternative version of why should we assume that compound A is, is competitive and compound B is non-competitive. Any other individual to also give us their view? Aham. Uh -huh. Let me read Michelle is saying compound A is competitive because the rate of reaction increases with increase in substrate concentration. Well, compound B is non competitive because its rate remains constant with increase in substrate concentration. Aha. Uh -huh. Let me read again what Michelle is saying. Compound A is competitive because the rate of reaction increases with the increase in substrate concentration, which is true. You can all see it in the graph that for when B, when A is present, the more you increase the substrates, the more also the rate of reaction keeps on increasing. It goes, it increases, actually at very high concentrations, very high concentrations of the substrate. You can see that what compound A is present, almost the rate of reaction is the almost equaling the rate of reaction when compound A and B are absent. So it means that now compound A is not all that aggressive to prevent the reaction from taking place when we increase our substrate concentration. But for compound B, let me also read verbatim what she what she had written. She said that when well compound B is non-competitive because its rate remains constant with increase in substrate concentration. Now, don't say that it because its rate remains constant because from here up to here, from zero to 10, this rate is not constant. However, what you ought to have said that uh, because because from 10 onwards, when you increase the concentration of the substrate, the increase in substrate concentration will not have any effect on the rate of reaction. You say after 10, 10 millimolars, further increase in substrate concentration does not have effect on the rate of reaction. Like that. So we are, I hope we are now on this at the same page. Now, briefly, for our comrades, senior fives, even senior six who forgot all about these things. 
Um, uh -huh. um, there's a supplement coming in in my inbox that non-competitive inhibitor combines with the enzyme at a point other than the active site. Now here we are learning now, we are revising. Because you may go in a question, I ask you what are non-competitive inhibitors? So senior five, senior six, you last done these things last year. So now is the chance to, or the opponent, or the opponent to revise these things. So they are saying non-competitive inhibitor combines with the enzyme at a point other than the active site. Um, this point is called allosteric site. Ah, now you are distorting things here now. Let me see who is this. Uh, Ryan, 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 this is not an allosteric site, please. It's not an, allost an allosteric site. Allosteric sites are different. So please, when you're explaining things of non-competitive inhibitors, avoid mentioning things like allosteric sites. An allosteric site is completely different. Okay. So they are saying that, okay, I will repeat to having removed that point, which is confusing. The non-competitive inhibitor combines with the enzyme at a point other than the active site. This distorts the shape of the active site. And so the substrates can't configure with the active site. A. Uh -huh. Then Sharon Newton seems now to have given us a very brief summary that actually I was looking out for. Compound A is competitive because the rate of reaction attains maximum at high substrate concentrations. Compound B is non-competitive because the rate of reaction attains maximum at low substrate concentrations. Uh -huh. Now me, I will want to modify Sharon's response into what the response would be. Um, Sharon is saying that compound A is competitive inhibitor because the rate of reaction attains a maximum at higher substrate concentrations. I can modify it in this way. Instead of saying because it attains a high maximum concentrations, I would just say because very high temperatures, so a very high substrate concentrations. So I can say that the rate of reaction at very high substrate concentrations is almost the same as the rate of concept as the rate of reaction without the inhibitor. Like that. Then when you say compound B is non-competitive because the rate of reaction attains maximum at low substrate concentrations, I can still add on that one. I can say, and even with the further increase in substrate concentration, the inhibitor will not have any effect. So the, the increase in substrate concentration will not have any effect on the rate of reaction. Uh -huh. Then the past is saying, but is it wrong to say non-competitive combine allosterically to the enzyme? It's also wrong. Now, uh, what is an allosteric site? So of course I used it to define non-competitive inhibitor. Okay, now let me also clarify on what an allosteric site is. Um, let me use some annotations here. Now, we have our enzyme. This enzyme has an active site. So this is our active site, this one here. So our active site is shaped in, in, in shape of a triangle, this one here. So it means that the substrate that this enzyme is going to work on must be in that shape of a triangle that will be able to fit well in the active site. If the substrate comes and it is the, the, in the shape of a sub, then this substrate will not be able to fit in the enzyme, therefore it will not be worked on. Now, what is a competitive inhibitor? Competitive, the word competitive comes in by the fact that the inhibitor competes 
for the same active site with the substrate. That the substrate and the inhibitor are both competing for the same active site. The inhibitor also wants to be broken down, but it is competing for that active site with the substrate. So it means now also the inhibitor will have the same shape as the shape of the active, as the shape of the substrate. So I will assume in red is now my inhibitor. So if I have my reaction and indeed in my reaction, I put there the enzyme, the substrate and the inhibitor. Now all of these will start competing for this active site, all of them. In the end, it will, it will slow us down. It will reduce the rate of forming products because one minute the product is, the, the substrate is combining with a form product. Then another minute, now instead of the substrate joining, now it is the inhibitor joining. We lose out on that time. That's why you see that the inhibitor always slows down or reduces the rate of reaction. Then, so that's why we're saying that now this is competitive. The inhibitor competes with the substrate. Now, what do you do to, re, to minimize or to reduce the effect of this inhibitor? So you provide more of the substrates. Increase the concentration of the substrate. So when you increase the concentration of the substrate, what does it mean? It means that now the enzyme will have more chances of colliding with the substrate than with the inhibitor. Why? Because we have many substrates than inhibitors. That's why when you increase the substrate, then the inhibitor is actually outcompeted. And when the inhibitor is outcompeted, then you're going to form more and more. So it means now at very high concentrations of the substrate, you're going to form, you're going to have a higher rate of reaction. That's so even you see in our graph, you see here in our graph that at very high concentrations, the rate of reaction is also very high, almost equaling the rate of reaction in absence of these inhibitors. But look here at this point here, what is happening? At this point, the rate of reaction is still low compared to this point here when the inhibitors were absent. Then now at this point here, the substrate and the inhibitor were still competing for the active site. So when you increase the substrate concentration, then the inhibitor is going to be outcompeted. That's why you see here we have a very high, a very high maximum rate of reaction, almost close to where or to when the compounds or the inhibitors were absent. So that is a competitive inhibitor. Then what is a non-competitive inhibitor? A non-competitive inhibitor is this. For it, it has nothing it wants from the active site, nothing. The only thing it will do, the, the inhibitor will come and attach elsewhere, it may come and attach itself here. And when it attaches itself here, the attachment here ends up distorting this shape here. Now, if the shape was like that, then the shape may again be squinted. You find that now the shape of the active site is going to change. Why is it changing? Because something has attached itself here and it stretched this shape. Then when the substrate comes, the substrate will not be able to fit well in this active site. So this is now the inhibitor, the one we call non-competitive. But for it, it is not competing. It is non-competitive. It is not competing with the substrate for the active site, no. So in this case, if this inhibitor comes and attaches here, even if you increase the substrate, the rate of reaction will not increase. Why? Because the active site has been distorted. And then why is it that 
what is happening here in this point? Why is it that still? Because even when you look here, the rate of reaction is still taking place. Yet we have the in non competitive inhibitor. Now, it doesn't mean that all the enzymes that we have are attached to inhibitors. No. Remember the inhibitor, we used a concentration from the question, the concentration of the, the, concentration of the inhibitor was 0 0.2 molar. So these inhibitors, these ones here, for them, they are able to keep the reaction at this rate, at 60. So it means now at this point here, all at this point, some of the enzymes are permanently but attached to non-competitive inhibitors. Hence, they are not working. They are not forming products. Then the few that are not attached to the inhibitors are the ones that are responsible for maintaining the rate of reaction at this figure here. Even if you increase the substrates, it has no effect. Why? because the enzymes, most of the enzymes have been distorted. So that is a non-competitive inhibitor. And now what is an allosteric inhibitor now? There are enzymes, there are enzymes which have two sites. They have an active site and they also have another binding site only reserved for the inhibitor. So take note, allosteric enzymes, these are the enzymes which have two active sites or two binding sites. One binding site is reserved for the substrate. Another binding site is reserved for an inhibitor. Take note that in our first in, in this one here, in this one here, this inhibitor just attached itself anywhere on the enzyme apart from the active site. It attached itself anywhere, but now for an allosteric enzyme, for it, it has a special place dedicated for the binding of an inhibitor. And this inhibitor must also be complementary to the active to the shape here. Therefore, these inhibitors are called allosteric inhibitors. Then the enzyme that have those sites are called allosteric enzymes. An example, when we find these allosteric inhibitors, we find them in end product inhibition in reactions which are inhibited by their end products. That's how we find these allosteric enzymes. So I hope it is now clear. Allosteric enzymes are there. Then we also have other enzymes that are affected by non-competitive inhibitors. Yes, hope. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hope let me unmute you again. I had the uh -huh, hope you unmuted. You're again muting yourself. Okay, hope unmute yourself again. Sir, okay, I had a question. Eh? Oh, on that allosteric inhibitor, when you're explaining, are there chemicals that bind with that binding site or the product are the one that bind with the with the site? Because there is a question that said that explain how the end product what inhibition is an example of a negative feedback. So, so there you explain that he, after the products becoming in, like when they become much, eh, they're the ones yeah, that combine with that binding um, site or Yes, to cut the story short, actually it is the products that now act as the inhibitors. So it is the product that acts as allosteric inhibitor. Hope is that clear? 
So, okay, how would they act as a negative feedback mechanism? Of course, negative feedback means when something increases, then it has to be reduced. Mm -hmm. So when you form more products, then these products come and stop mm -hmm. the enzymes from producing more products. That is negative feedback. Okay. Mm. Yes, Tivenda? So, so for me, I'm asking for more clarification. Does it mean mm. that not all non-competitive inhibitors are allosteric inhibitors? True. And then the other thing, uh, end product inhibitors, are they all allosteric inhibitors? Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, so let me go in books and see. Um, uh -huh. Sharon is asking, is it true that allosteric enzymes are the ones that can be secreted in inactive form, like uh, pepsinogen? Ah, uh, uh, no, it is not true. Um, okay. Michelle is asking, how does an enzyme differ, differ from a catalyst? An enzyme is a, an enzyme. It is, a, it, it is a, a protein. Catalysts are not proteins in nature. Okay. So now, from that little knowledge, I think we now all have an idea on this question. Now, other things, if there are things we have talked about and you had forgotten them, then you have to go the notes and revise. Now, to our question. Question number one, describe the relationship between the rate of reaction and the substrate concentration when compounds A and B were absent. Uh -huh. Now I'm only entertaining uh, answers. Um, first is saying as the product increases, it accumulates and stop its own product. I think this is how an act as negative feedback. Uh, yes. Um, other fatty saying, can there be allosteric activators? No, they're not there. May, may, or even their enzyme activators, if they are there, then they are the same as enzyme activators. Okay. So I want you to write down these questions here. Roman number one, Roman number two, and Roman number three. I want to go up and display the graph. Then I want someone summarize down your descriptions and read for us exactly what you have written. Are the instructions, I hope the instructions are clear. I have said that, right, we are answering question A. So first get your notebooks, write question A both of those Roman numbers. Then after, I want you now to rate the answers, the expected responses. How do you describe the relationship between the rate of reaction and substrate concentration when compounds A and B were present, when compound A was present, and e, when compound B is also present. So I'm giving you three minutes for that assignment. Then if you have finished writing down, kindly, when you raise up your hand, I want you just to read for us what you have written exactly. Don't brainstorm from the head. First, write how you describe. Then I want you to read for us what you have written. So, hope the questions have been written. Maybe let me minimize. Okay, so part A, Roman number one. Who has finished part A, Roman number one? Aha, uh -huh, who has finished part A, Roman number one?
Yes, Tivenda. From zero to 10 mm, the rate of reaction increases rapidly. From 10 to 15 mm, the rate of reaction increases gradually. Then from 15 to 30 mm, the rate of reaction is almost constant. Okay. Uh -huh. Another person. Hope, how comes I'm having very few? Hope then after Queen Patricia will also come. So hope first, then Queen Patricia follows. Increase in substrate concentration. Okay. From, increase in substrate concentration from zero to 10 increases the rate of reaction. So when the compounds A and B are absent uh, rapidly, then from 10 to 15, uh, then increase in subsequent concentration from 10 to 15 mn, uh, the rate of reaction for compound, when compounds A and B absent increases what? Gradually. Then now from 15 to 30, uh, increase in the rate of reaction from 15 to 30, uh, increase the rate of reaction for, for what? For when compounds A and B absent, means almost constant. Okay, thank you. Queen Patricia? Okay, sir. As substrate concentration increased from zero mm -hmm. mm to 10, the rate of reaction increased rapidly. As substrate concentration increased from 10 mm to 15, the rate of reaction increased gradually. As substrate concentration increased from 15 mm to 30 mm, the rate of reaction is relatively constant. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon? Okay, as the substrate concentration increases from zero to 10 mm, the rate of reaction also increases rapidly. As substrate concentration increases from 10 to 15 mm, the rate of reaction also increases gradually. As substrate concentration increases from 15 to 30 mm, the rate of reaction remains constant. Okay, thank you so much. I think now those ones are enough. Now, um, I'm happy that most of we have four who presented at least 50% got the question right. When they say describe a relationship, in most cases, you find that for your relationship to come out, you may not avoid using the word as. as. That's how we get relationship. But what is the relationship between this and this? Or oh, as this one is doing this, the other one is also doing that. As this is doing this, this is also doing this. So relationship, you find that you may almost fail to dodge using the word as. So in your relationships, please endeavor to make sure that you use that word as, because they bring out the relationship very well. Now, don't assume that whenever they ask to describe, for you know that it is just about describing, but because they can say, describe the effect of, describe the relationship, they describe the graph. Those three questions are completely different. Describe the graph. That's when you start. From zero to 10, rate of reaction increased rapidly, full stop. From 10 to 15, rate of reaction increases gradually, full stop. There, you are describing the graph. You're describing how the graph looks like. Then they can also describe the effect. Of course, it will be describe the effect of what? And on what? Describe the effect of what 
and on what? For instance, I would say, describe the effect of increasing substrate concentration on the rate of reaction. Now, how do I go on answering that question of describe the effect? You find that also there are some terms which you will not avoid using. For instance, I would say that an increase in the substrate concentration from zero to 10 causes a rapid increase, results in two, a rapid decrease, brings about a rapid decrease. There I'm now describing the effect of something on something. So when they ask to describe effect, it means that now in your description, these three words, you, these three words, are the ones which you're likely to use. Either causes or results into or brings about. There you'll be describing the effect. For instance, I've given an example. I've set a question that describe the effect of substrate concentration on the rate of reaction. And I have said, this is my response, that increase in the substrate concentration from zero to 10 causes or results in two, a rapid increase in the rate of reaction, full stop. An increase in the substrate concentration from 10 to 15 results in two, a gradual increase in the rate of reaction. Further increase from 15 to 30 almost has no effect on the rate of reaction. Don't say that now that one causes the the, 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 the thing to remain constant may not make much sense there. And that can be now, maybe next time we meet, I will, maybe I will design questions targeting that area. So I hope now we have gotten these three things. Describe the relationship, describe the effect, and describe the graph. Hope now we have gotten those things there. Okay, so let me look at inbox. Uh, what of leads two? Yeah, now Ryan is saying what of leads two? Leads two can also be on the effect. Instead of saying causes or results in two, you can also say leads two, the same thing. Then she is asking, is it true that when they say explain or describe the changes in the graph, we don't talk about the constant as it is not a change. Um, now the change, it depends which change they're asking you to talk about. It depends which change. Now there, I don't want to respond to that because different graphs have different circumstances or scenarios. You may misquote me. Um, yes, Nuamanya. Norman, you can unmute yourself. Norman is not with us. Um, uh, Perpetua is saying, could describing change be the same as describing the variation? Yes, it is the same. Describing change is the same as describing the variation. Tell me on the words like uh, those on description. Okay, we shall talk, ex explain about the description of the graph. We shall come to those ones later. Okay, so I hope now we have 
understood how we describe a relationship, how we describe an effect, and how we just describe a graph. Okay, now, having gotten those tips, who is now going to describe the relationship between the rate of reaction and substrate concentration when compound A was present? Who is going to describe that relationship? Um, Ryan? Ryan? What happened? How is the relationship of this? A substrate concentration increases from zero twenty eight. The rate of reaction increases. Then a substrate concentration increases to twenty eight thirty millimolar. The rate of reaction remains constant. Thank you. Yeah. I can't say I heard very well. Your network was breaking on my side. Um, but I hope if it was clear, others have been able to hear. Uh -huh. Another person, how can we describe that relationship? Roman number two, who else can also give us their view? People are quiet now. What have you written? By the way, the best way to benefit from these discussions, you sit with a pen and a notebook. Learn to always read or revise with pens in your hands. Anything new that I talk about, you write it down. Anything new I talk about, you write it down like that. Um, yes, Hope? So you raise call first of all the graph. We are not seeing the upper side, you're only seeing the down one. Okay. Just like that. Hmm. Uh, let me see what is there. Um, Okay, so yes. for me, I will describe mm -hmm. that from okay, the relationship eh? as the substance concentration increases from zero eh? to yes. five. Mm -hmm. Let me say to yeah, 25. Eh? Uh, the rate of reaction is compound A increases rapidly. Why are you saying rapid? Is it rapid when you compare it with the others? No, compare, okay, compared to, so it's gradual. Uh, so you repeat the statement? From uh, zero to around 25, so, okay, as the, Substrate concentration increases from zero to around 25 mm. Why are you saying around? Can't you be specific? Why are you saying around? Okay, it's 25 mm. Mm -hmm. The rate of reaction um, increases gradually. Mm. Then now from 25 to Increase as the, the concentration, as the substrate concentration increases from 25 to 30 mm, the rate of reaction in, or it remains almost constant. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Last, lastly, Tivenda. As substrate concentration increases from 0 to 27 mm, 
-hmm. the rate of reaction increases gradually mm -hmm. to a maximum. Mm -hmm. Then a substrate concentration increases from 27 to 30 mm. Mm. The rate of reaction is almost constant. Wonderful. So I think let us stop with the together. So that is it. As the substrate concentration increases from zero to 27. And by the way, when you're putting these values on the horizontal axis, try as much as possible to be specific. Try as much as possible to be specific. Which value? This graph has scales. You can determine the value here. You can determine it. Maybe you can say so Don't always generalize. You can determine, don't always. You see, if it is 27, mention that it is 27. So as that, as the substance solution increases from zero to 27 mm, the rate of reaction increases gradually to a maximum. Why maximum? Because it remains there afterwards. Then as substrate concentration increases from 27 to 30 mm, the rate of reaction remains almost constant. Now, when do we use the word almost? And when do we not use the word almost? When you look at the graph for when compounds A and B are absent, and you look at this graph here, When you look at this, this graph here, you re realize that this thing is not actually constant as you may think. When you compare this to the one when B was present, see now when B is present, it is actually a very straight line. So for B, this is now constant. But for A and the absence of both, where it is not clear whether gradual, whether what, then we'll describe it as almost constant okay so i hope that one is clear um <laughs> when patricia i hope you're asking a question when patricia okay tendo Uh, yes, teacher. I have a question. Uh, why did we say on this on this other graph for where the compound A is absent? Why did we say it's gradual? Because the thing is straight. I thought if it's straight like this, then they are still rapid. Do you please explain why she said gradual? Okay, thank you. Now, whenever you're given graphs, you have now to ask yourself to plan. Which graph are you going to describe as gradual and which which change are you describe as rapid? So you look at them. If you look at this and this, one must be rapid and one must be gradual. So it's up to you pick which one should I describe as gradual and which one should I describe as rapid. Gradual doesn't mean that the graph doesn't have to be straight. Gradual means that it increases not so fast. So that's why here we are using the word rapid. Even here we're using the word rapid. So the gradual for compound A present is gradual. Then now for compound B, which one, which term would describe this change? Should we, should we say gradual or rapid? Now to me on B, would still say rapid D increase. Though later, when we now come to compare, then we shall, so we shall say that in this one, the graph increases more rapidly than the graph when B is present. But when we are describing B alone in this case, we shall have to use rapid. When you're describing A alone, a is gradual because you arrive there, you first look at these others, these other graphs. 
That's how you conclude by saying now this one must be Rajo. Not that it is rapid because it is a straight line, no. Um, now, Leticia is saying that on the graph, it looks like to be, seems very rapid and then less rapid. Now, don't use those words less and very unless you are comparing two graphs. If you're describing one graph, just one graph like this, don't use the word very rapid, more rapid or less. Stick to one word. It is either rapid or gradual. Use those comparative words that are very, more, less rapid, what, what, when you are comparing two graphs. Like here, if they ask you to compare graph when compound A and B are absent and when B is present. Now that's when I will say that from zero to 10, rate of reaction in compound A increases more rapidly than rate of reaction in compound D when compound B is present, like that. Um, I hope you've taken note of that. Okay, uh, so, so still you'll try out part B. Now, lastly, explain. Now with explain here, now this one, there is no technicality here, apart from now knowing the content. And the content that you're going to use here, you must have developed that content when you were interpreting the graph. You realize that I spent 30 minutes trying to interpret for you the graph, hoping that now the ideas I gave you are enough to help you explain. But when you are explaining, for every change that you describe, you explain that change. For instance, they wanted to explain the results in absence of compounds A. Whenever asked to explain, the first thing to do is to describe. That should always be the first thing. For instance, I'll give you an example. I'm going to answer Roman number one. Then from there, you can now based on, in your free time, you should now be able to answer Roman number two and Roman number three. So I'm explaining Roman number one. Of course, what should I start with? Describing it. That from zero to, uh, from zero to, from zero to 10, sub mm, the rate of reaction increases rapidly because ah, now I give my reason. Why is it that during that time, the rate of reaction is increasing rapidly? Now I'll go back to my explanation of how substrates affect rates of enzyme activity. And if it is a revision question, then you have to go to the notes and look for the explanation. How? does increase in substrate concentration actually affect the rate of reaction. That increase in substrate concentration further increases the rate or the chances of enzymes colliding with the substrates to form products. The more the substrates, the higher the chances of substrates colliding with the enzymes to form products. I have explained why I think substrate concentration increases the rate of reaction. Then from 10 to 15 mm rate of reaction increases gradually to a maximum because I would say the rate of reaction increases gradually 
because at that point, other factors other than substrate concentration are starting, the word is are starting to limit or to lower the rate of reaction like that. Then from, from 15 to 30, substrate, MM, substrate concentration, the rate of reaction remains constant, almost near or slightly below the maximum reaction rate. I have also to put it there because it's shown in the graph that the rate of reaction remains, remains high and constant slightly below the maximum reaction rate because at this point all the enzymes present are saturated with substrates there are four other substrates will not have active sites to bind to because all the active sites are saturated with substrates. So that's the explanation why it remains there. Then I also have again to explain why I emphasize that point of slightly below the maximum reaction rate. Then I can also, I can also talk about its expansion. The rate of reaction remains constant and high, but slightly below the maximum reaction rate because other factors other than substrate concentration are preventing the reaction from attaining its maximum rate. Full stop. So that's how I would explain such a graph. Now, in your free time, you'll try out the one where compound A is present. Now, in your explanation, that's when you have now to tell us how compound A works and how you think is slowing down the rate of reaction. In other words, if you say that from zero to 27, the rate of reaction increases gradually because, then you say because compound A is present and compound A is a non, so compound A is a competitive inhibitor, which works like this and this and that. There are four, during that time, the rate, the rate increases gradually because the inhibitor is competing with the substrate for the active site, full stop. Then from 27 to 30, also tell us why. We said that the rate of reaction now remains constant, almost close to the maximum rate of reaction because high concentrations outcompete the competitive inhibitor. I will have finished explaining that point as well. So that is how we explain graphs. Okay. So that is, that is it for today. Remember, the intention is not to get a question and program the answers. The intention is what did you learn from our discussion? How would you improve yourself while answering other questions related to this one that are not specifically this very question? And I believe today we have learned a lot. So next time, God willing, that if we're able to have more engagements, we shall be looking at more, more scenarios, more because each graph comes its own scenario. And we shall be exploring how different graphs can be explained and answered. But however, there is a very negative attitude, which I always hear from students. Don't assume that the biology is all the biology is based on graphs. For you, if you have issues with the graphs, then biology you're going to fail. 
biology is not only about graphs. First, read and understand the content of biology. Remember, there is also section B, where there is no graph. And actually, your worry, much of your worry should be in that section B. Are you good in that section B? Because it carries the 60 marks. So as you're reading, please also focus on section B questions, not on the own graph one. Okay. So because of time, I think we can stop from, from here. So have a nice day. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, sir. Welcome. So, teacher, when are you possibly meeting again? Mm, follow the timetable. We always draft weekly ones. Okay. Depending on our so just a week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the lesson. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes. Don't we pray thank God? <laughs> Excuse me, sir.